Okay, buddy, it is 12 o'clock. Thanks for attending today's webinar on the Clean Equipment Protocol. It's the fourth in a series of eight for 2016 based on our Best Management Protocol booklet series. I hope everybody can hear me. hope everybody can see the screen. If you're having any difficulties, please uh, write something in the chat box and we'll try to clear that up for you. Uh, I also have provided a toll-free help number uh, for any participants having problems. My name is Amanda Warren. I'm the Outreach Liaison, and I'm very pleased to be delivering this webinar today. Just a few logistics before we get started. For those of you with headsets, you should be okay. For those of you who would like to switch to the telephone for you, press, uh, that helpline will be appropriate for you, too. It's 1-855-797-9485, and the access code is 662 238, you can find that in the chat box. The phones are on mute and they will be on mute during the presentation and as well for the answer period. So please tell of your questions in the question and answer, not chat box, the question and answer box, please. And our panelists will answer them at the end. I would like to now introduce our panelists for today who is with me at the office, Joe. Welcome, Joe Halloran. He grew up in Australia, where he obtained a degree in ecology and environmental sciences, as I understand, right? That's right. Uh, he's been working well, in Australia. He worked for the provincial government and uh, environmental NGO for six years, and then moved to Canada in 2008, uh, apparently just for the weather we were just <laughs> talking about. He worked Toronto Regional Conservation Authority for two years and then moved to the MNRF where he's, he is now and he's been in a variety of roles uh, from stewardship to renewable energy, species at risk, and now you are the Values Collection Coordinator Correct. For, for this year? Yes, that's right. That's wonderful. What, what does that entail? Am I allowed to ask? What's uh, that, what's the, what is the major kind of duties of your, maybe not duties, but what do you work with particularly? Uh, yeah, for this role, it's um, collecting uh, values for uh, uh, for the forest industry, so then uh, utilizing uh, Crown Land Forests. And that's Well, you're at spot for us. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer a lot of our questions today. So once again, please uh, write those questions in the question and answer box. We will not be taking any phone calls. The presentation will be approximately 30 to 4 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we will use the rest of the hour for questions and discussion. And I'd like to also mention that the webinars will be recorded and put on our website so that those able to participate today or if you have to leave early, you can view that on your own time. Some of the slides are particularly wordy. That's done on purpose. So when you go to look at the slides uh, without audio, uh, they will be self-explanatory. Wonderful. A little bit of technical difficulties there, but we've got it fixed now. Our management practice webinar for those of you who don't know, we're developed to provide land managers and really anyone interested or working with plants with the proper tools for accurately identifying and effectively controlling invasive plants. It's funded by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in order to support the key actions of the Ontario Invasive Species Strategic Plan, which was published in 2012. We've had three Phragmites-based focused webinars already. Uh, this is the fourth. This is the protocol. In two weeks' time, we'll have a Grow Me Instead uh, webinar, which is focused towards horticulturalists and gardeners. The last three will be plant-specific ones. Are all based on our best management practice documents. Please, if you have the ability and you have a good social media um, way of doing so, pass on our webinar notices and let people know, get the message out that we have these webinars available and that they are available online. More people can share in our knowledge. The best management practice booklets are available on our site, free of charge, uh, and they are available, some of them only uh, online, some of them are available in print, 
let us know how many you need, uh, and we will do our best to get them to you. We have also coming up a new road BMP for freight binding. Um, that's specifically aimed towards the, uh, controlling and managing managing Phragmites on roadside construction for uh, construction and uh, road maintenance people. And we also have a Phragmites site prioritization tool in the works. We also have two new plant specific uh, BMP. So keep Eyes open and, and look at our website or sign up for our newsletter to get all the information on new documents for invasive species. A little bit us now. The Ontario Invasive Plant Council was formed in 2007. We're a multi sector non profit organization. Uh, we provide leadership and expertise and a forum to engage in the Ontarians to take action on all sorts of invasive plant issues. We buy and we consist of representatives from all levels of government, from uh, non-governmental organizations as well, from academia, nations, industry, and of course private individuals and interested parties as well. Uh, we staff members at the moment, myself being one of them, and we take our direction from the board of directors and of course our members. And we have six committees. It's very hard to bring the, the programs uh, publications that are available on our website. If you are interested in becoming a member and are sitting on one of our committees, we would be more than happy to have you. Please contact me at amanda at oninvasives.ca or through our website. Some of the projects and uh, products can be seen here. We do everything from technical documents uh, to awareness campaigns and uh, training um, webinars, seminars, and workshops. And we have quite a bit for um, all levels of, of interest from horticulturalists to children, for instance, of an Invader Raiders activity and coloring book that's available for you. Hey, okay, for the adults that like to color, that's a new thing now. These adult coloring books. So go ahead. Equipment protocol best management practices in Ontario. This equipment was designed to provide land managers. I say land managers, but this is really for anybody that's looking to, to work with these species, uh, invasive species. Rules and accurate information about the spread. This is all about preventing the spread of invasive plants, um, which is usually spread. In, in, in this case, we're focusing on equipment. We're going to talk a little bit about the background, uh, what are invasive plants, the pathways of spread, uh, intentional and unintentional introduction, their impacts, when to inspect, when, where, and how to clean. And we've included some cleaning diagrams and checklists to make life more clear. This project was spearheaded by our panelist, Joe Halloran, and the Peterborough Stewardship Council, of which he was part of at the time. And it was inspired by a similar document in Australia called Keeping It Clean, which was actually from Tasmania. Do you want to give a little background about that, Joe? Peter. Sure. Um, yeah, the invasive species management and prevention became a very hot topic in Australia. There's a lot of impacts similar to here in Ontario terrestrial base and aquatic base, um, and then the different states or provinces had different uh, methods to, to try and reduce the spread and prevent the spread. Um, so I was fortunate to work in Queensland where they had a similar document to keeping it clean, and then, but the Tasmanian document was more a newer version and it had more information in it um, that was used to, uh, I guess, inspire people to get people to come in there and kind of put uh, practices into action. Um, and then when I started working with the Stewardship Council, I was kind of fortunate enough there to be given a, the opportunity to kind of pursue something. And, and um, this sort of came into into my mind as, as something that would support 
as you said, some of the invasive species strategies and different things that's happening there in Ontario. Um, and then so I was able to kind of partner up with the Invasive Plant Council and get a few dollars from the Invasive Species Centre and then we're able to just uh, pull this document together and, and base it in, from Australia, but then also and with all the people who provided that technical input on the document to make it really practical for, for an Ontario situation. It's been used by a lot of people, and we'll get to that a little bit later, yeah. Uh, again, that was funded originally by Invasive Species Centre. Yep. Uh, the document, we re realize that every situation is different. So this document is great because you can tailor it specifically to your own firm and to your own needs. Uh, so it's very flexible. Two who haven't been with us for our other webinars may not be aware. Invasive plants uh, are full alien species. Now, alien plants or alien species have been defined by the Invasive Alien Species Strategy for Canada, a government document. Uh, are plants, animals, and microorganisms introduced into an area beyond their native range? So they may or may not be uh, native to Ontario or or Canada or North America, uh, but they're not native to the uh, to that particular area. So they're outside of their native range. And plants are those harmful alien species. Introduction or spread threatens either the environment and or economy and or society and or human health. So typically become very widespread and prevalent very quickly. Uh, because of a uh, wide range, range of, of um, either environments that they can grow or under they, they can grow under different uh, growing conditions, uh, very hardy, um, or they produce uh, a lot of seeds, or they can reproduce in a number of different ways. And the ecological effects of these invasive plants uh, can often be irreversible. Once invasive plants are extremely difficult and costly to eradicate. And, uh, you'll see in our slides some of the top invasive plants in Ontario have been included throughout the presentation. And this particular plant on the left-hand side of your screen is Japanese knotweed, and it's a particularly nasty plant here and uh, in the UK as well. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but it can push up driveways, it can push through brick walls, it can go through three to four inches of concrete and tarmac. And uh, it can stay dormant for up to 20 years um, and reproduce through tiniest, tiniest um, bits of root fragments and rhizomes. So, particularly nasty plant and a big problem, becoming a big problem in Ontario. Um, there's just really three roots, or well, four major pathways. Pathways are just roots or, or ways in which a, a plant is dispersed. And the uh, pathways include intentional pathways and interactions and unintentional introductions. So, uh, think of tourism and travel. When you're hiking, the seeds uh, and plant bits can be trapped uh, bottom of your foot uh, and your shoe and transported to a new new environment. Um, you're, you're in a new country and you're packing little bits of shell or or things that uh, you pack in your suitcase and bring over from another from another place. Uh, trade, for instance, goods that are shipped overseas uh, can be contaminated with invasive plants. Recreational activities, such as boating, uh, plants can be uh, transported from one water body to another, for instance, with boats. Um, and these are uh, unintended. My goodness, can you say that? Unintentional introduction. Ah, yes. It's like a Monday for some reason. Um, and the other natural pathways are are just that. They're nature spreading. So wind, water, and animals. Um, unintentional introductions are, are, are accidental, but there are also uh, intentional introductions, for instance, through horticulture and gardening. Where people bring in them as an ornamental and then escape their gardens and go wild and become invasive in the environment. Some of the important everyday vectors um, through invasive plants can spread. Uh, everything from pets and shoes, uh, equipment, even lawn chairs. 
So cleaning your equipment doesn't always just mean industry uh, tractors and cars and trucks, but also your personal equipment and your everything. Well, on unintentional introductions. The problem with invasive plants is that they spread, and they can spread via contaminated mud, uh, gravel, water, soil. Uh, plant material can go from one place to another and travel uh, in the crevices and, and part and tires of equipment um, without you even noticing. Uh, it can be little seeds that uh, are caked in, into a little ball of mud that's uh, stuck in your tire. And uh, some examples of studies, for instance, one from the uh, Montana State University that has shown that 96 to 99% of seeds that were attached to vehicles, seed attached, up to 257 kilometers under dry conditions. So things can spread uh, from one uh, environment to another very quickly, and um, it's implausible. Uh, study and more can be found at msu.mantana.edu if you want to read more about it. Spread and distribution studies have also been done, for instance, on Phragmites, directly correlating the spread of, of Phragmites with highway construction. Uh, studies such as Atling and Mitro from 2011, uh, Lelong et al. from 2007, and Lelong et al. from 2005. The message here is that if you fail to properly clean your vehicles and your machinery, this will result. It just can result, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say very likely to result in serious damage and impacts uh, to wherever you bring those non-native invasive species into. And also, something to note here that businesses may also face liability issues for activities which result in uh, invasive plant spread and introduction. Not just plants, but also other invasive species as well. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the invasive plant impacts. Um, as you see on the screen, this is garlic mustard. It can enter, establish itself, and dominate a forest understory in less than seven years, um, a little five years. It poisons the soil. Uh, so to speak, and prevents native plants from regrowing, which is the productivity of forests and costs the forestry industries a lot, and not just lost revenue, uh, but also control. There are a variety of, of impacts of the plants, and we're going to go through a few of them today. Uh, the growing threat, they have a lot of different impacts. They impact it in a lot of different ways and things you might not think about on an everyday uh, as being obvious. Um, the plants are easily introduced, they, they spread quickly, and they're very costly to control. They're much more costly to control after their establishment than, than the cost of preventing it in the first place. So preventing the spread really costs less than to control. Them. And and the costs are not just the control, but also the damages done to infrastructure, the cost of the removal, the loss of productivity, uh, reduced property values, and the damage to private homes. On your right, you'll see a wonderful picture of giant hogweed, which is kind of and enormous, but also a little dangerous. The sap uh, caused phytophotodermatitis. Uh, means that when sap gets onto your skin, it can burn and blister when exposed to the sun. So it's a bit of a nasty uh, plant and uh, difficult to control. It's listed in Ontario as a noxious weed. And um, aside from, from the human health perspective, it outcompetes native species and reduces biodiversity. Uh, impact economy, in addition to those, we have a few numbers here. Um, I'd keep in mind that these are estimates that are uh, probably a lot lower than, than actual numbers because it is quite difficult to take into account all of the costs associated with um, invasive plant management. Uh, in the U.S., uh, the causes of uh, invasive plants cause 
sorry, in species, not just in face of plant and invasive species, and as a whole cause economic and environmental damages totaling over $138 billion per year. A study by Kuladi et al. in 2006 said that the costs were somewhere between 13 and 34 billion per year for just 16 of the invasive species that they listed. Um, a few examples for Phragmites. Uh, one particular study showed that uh, in Canada, per year, the cost of controlling Phragmites was about 865 to over $1,100. And Ken Vey, if you were here for a few other of our uh, webinars earlier this year, Estimate from his experience that managing Phragmites using a wet blade system costs about $60,000 per kilometers of drainage that uh, they were cutting. So some big numbers lost. This is, um, should be something that everybody's thinking about because these costs are quite typical uh, municipality costs, which of course the taxpayers. Uh, impacts to construction, for instance, increased site preparation and weed control costs, these uh, reduced property values. Uh, Japanese knotweed, again, is an example in the, in the United Kingdom where it's classified as a hazardous material. Japanese knotweed can regenerate from the tiniest little piece of root or rhizome, and uh, it can lay dormant for up to 20 years, so it's really important that the cars sift through that entire uh, oil that's used uh, below the house but also removed from the house uh, at the construction zone and it has to be disposed of appropriately which means at a biohazard site and the equipment must be thoroughly cleaned. Extremely labor intensive, ex extremely costly and it increases the construction and operation time. And it's happening in Ontario right now, but it's it's not uh, unheard of. It's a possibility, of course. Then, of course, to forestry and agriculture, which are a little bit more obvious. Um, forestry, we mentioned uh, garlic mustard can prevent uh, forest regeneration. But also something called dog strangling vine. Filtered light and suppresses seedling establishment of native hardwoods. And it too poisons the soil around it. Uh, it reduces growth rates through shading as well, but it also poisons the, the soil around it, uh, moving other native plants from establishing. And as you can see from the pictures, these are dramatic. Uh, overgrowth of, of dogs such as wild parsnip uh, approach on and into agricultural fields. Uh, this too can reduce crop yield and increase pesticide use and costs. Now we just message on chat that uh, the audio breaks up at time. Uh, not sure for the reason for that, but uh, if anybody else is having trouble, uh, just uh, please write a little message on chat, and I'd like to see how widespread this problem with audio is. We will continue, however. Uh, the impacts of invasive plants to land management, for instance, trail use. Uh, trails are a perfect corridor, as well as uh, streets. Um, Of plants. Not only do plants, animals, sorry, not plants, but animals and people and, and vehicles such as ATVs, they can pick up um, invasive plant uh, bits and seeds and transport them uh, through the trail and down the trail, but that, that action of, of creating a trail and, and um, tracking down uh, the some people saying there is a little bit of a problem with the audio and some people that are not, that are saying it's fine. So I'm not sure where that lies. Uh, we'll check that out a little bit later. Hopefully uh, it's an isolated problem. Anyway, I was saying the soil uh, can be compacted on trails 
And usually that causes the plants not to be able to grow, but the invasive plants, which thrive in disturbed areas and can often grow through that hard, compacted soil, uh, are the ones that are going to survive and thrive in that environment. So uh, may, remember that people and pets and vehicles can all be vectors for uh, invasive uh, plants on trees. This leads to labor and, and the cost of maintenance, also to reduced biodiversity. On the hand side of your screen, you'll see reed canary grass, which is a problem especially in sensitive habitats, such as wetlands and savannas. It too harms biodiversity by reducing native plants, and it can do so in an ecosystem within five to six months. Mm -hmm. uh, this causes also an increase in flooding because it, it clogs wetlands and waterways and drainage paths and can change the hydrology of an entire system. Input now to road size and utilities. This seems something a little bit more obvious to anybody who's driving along the corridors uh, of, of Highway 7 or indeed for the 401. You can see Phragmites growing on both sides of the road. And because they grow quite high, they can obstruct visibility, not just on roads but on trails as well, and create a fire hazard. Both mites and mating grass leave dead stalks that, as you can see outside, even even in high depths of snow, you can see them sticking out, out on top. And uh, these dead stands uh, can be a fire hazard. So now, which plants are a problem? Which plants are the ones that are spreading through equipment? Well, the ones listed here and all of the ones listed throughout our presentation today are the top priorities in Ontario. Uh, anything from wild parsnip, I'm sure you've heard of in the media as of late, and giant hogweed, but also buckthorn, maiden grass, uh, phragmites, and wild chevrel can be spread. Not sure what's in your area. We have a great tool for that as well. It is called Edmaps. And Edmaps Ontario is a great way to report sightings and what's already in your area um, or, or what's on your way. So you know what to look for before you take your equipment into a new area. And you'll know which are the high prioritized area, priority areas. Um, you have to be on a lookout and especially careful when it comes to spreading invasive. This uh, free, it's easy to use, and we also have a new app phone which will be useful when you're in the field. Our website, uh, or go to the uh, edmaps.org site. You will need to make an account, but as I mentioned, it is free. So now we're getting into the clean equipment protocol itself. As mentioned, we aim to establish this is a standard for cleaning vehicles and equipment. It is voluntary at the moment in Ontario, but we hope to have a widespread adoption into uh, your own standard operating procedures for your your firm or your municipality and at home. Anything you want to say before we get started? Everything's good? Everything's good. All righty. Okay, we're going to get a little bit into so when to inspect. So the inspection, of course, is the first step. And you're going to uh, inspect your vehicle before moving vehicles out of an area. Of, uh, moving machinery between properties where invasive species are present, for instance, in one area, but not another. And you always want to schedule work in sites that are least disturbed and free of invasive species first, before visiting sites with a known infestation. So they're not uh, spreading invasive species a otherwise clean environment. You inspect before using machinery along roadsides, ditches, and water courses. And of course, with water courses, this is particularly important because spreading plants to and around water bodies means very limited choices for controlling it afterwards because chemicals and chemical use in and around water are very restricted and often prohibited. So keep it away from the water. Uh, and you want to inspect before visiting remote areas. Remote areas are less likely, likely to have been uh, 
infested by native plants because obviously there's less vectors accessing that remote area. If you want to that you inspect heading to also want to inspect after operating the earth area, which uh, is somewhere that uh, has known infestations of invasive plants. You can also check EdMaps for that. Uh, when you're you have supporting soil or quarry material, which all can be infested with seed and or plant parts. When you're eating in an area or transporting material that you aren't sure about, that it may be possibly carrying invasive species, or very importantly, in an event of rain, because it creates mud, and mud acts as a glue, which will stick to your vehicle over long distances and often um, seeds and plant parts in it. And once again, uh, how many people are having audio problems? So there's two people having audio problems. He has given us a tip that other participants should connect to computer audio from three open options. That here, I'm not really sure exactly what it means, but that's what she says. And you could tell folks to call in if the computer audio isn't working. So, one and that telephone number is one eight five five nine seven nine four eight five. If you're having trouble, and that's uh, listed in the chat box. The equipment that you're going to be needing for properly cleaning your vehicle and your equipment is, is where possible, uh, a pump and a high-pressure hose or a high-pressure water unit. Um, this means a minimum water pressure of about or over 90 pounds per square inch. Uh, an air compressor or vacuum, a stiff brush, well, an air compressor and or vacuum, a stiff brush or broom, a shovel, a pry bar, or something to pry, that'll pry mud and other uh, hardened clumps off your vehicle, uh, and a jack to, to make sure that you can jack up your vehicle and look underneath. So this is something that seems to be kind of uh, uh, second nature. You're going to look inside and outside your vehicle, not just outside, but inside as well, because things can be spread uh, through your boots. Um, and uh, putting equipment inside the vehicle and taking it out again. So make sure that everything inside and out is free. And plant material and seeds that might be lodged or stuck to any surfaces. And you're going to want to re remove, where practical, where possible, any guards, covers, or plates that are easy to remove. And inspect, especially inspect the underside of the vehicle. Spare tires, foot wells, bumpers. Uh, if you see a clot of dirt or other plant material, then your next step is to remove that. Clean. Now, this is a bit of an issue. Not always easy to find a place to, that, that's practical. Um, but you want to make sure that where cleaning it's free of mud, uh, gravel covered, if possible, a hard surface. And if those places aren't available, then you want to find a well grassy area. Just sloping. This will allow the water to drain away from the vehicle, but make sure that the slope runs back into the infested area and not into another area that's, that, that's clean uh, or hasn't been worked in or on or near a water course. So at least three minutes from water course or water body because the, uh, the plants and parts of the seeds can be spread downstream through water. In an area that's going to be large enough to allow for adequate movement of large equipment, and you want somewhere that you can monitor easily for the establishment of invasive plants. Somewhere that you're going to have to crush the invasive plants that you've just washed off your vehicle. Now, obviously, you're going to clean. Uh, if you found any evidence 
of invasive plant contamination on your vehicle. Uh, vehicles that have stayed on formed and sealed roads have more of a, a low risk of spreading invasive species, but as we can see through the 401 uh, and, and along southern Ontario, uh, even invasive fragments, which have large seed heads and produce vast amounts of seeds, uh, those seeds can attach quite easily even on a sealed surface road. Roadway. So really, you re are required to clean only when visual inspection identifies dirt claws or plant material. Uh, but depending on the species present, cleaning may even be required in deep snow, like Phragmites, uh, which have seed heads that stick out above the snow. So even if you are uh, working in snow, you might be able to pick contaminate your vehicle with invasive seeds. Now we're going to work a little bit on how to clean, which of course is a little bit of an obvious uh, way of thinking, but it's good to go over. You're going to clean the interior by sweeping and vacuuming or using this compressed air device. First thing you do, you're going to pay attention to the floors, to the foot pedals, to both sides of the pedals and under the seats. Side of the vehicle, you want to make sure you knock off all of the closet dirt first. Get the big stuff first. Pry it off if you have to with a, with a bar. Uh, identify those areas that you're going to need to clean with air rather than water, as radiators and grills. And you'll want to clean those areas first. Then after that, with a high pressured hose, uh, in combination with a stiff brush, to make sure that you get all of the uh, the mud and material off the car. Uh, usually in the shower, you start from top to work to bottom, and you work down, uh, washing and cleaning from top to bottom. An emphasis should always be placed on areas harder to clean, like the wheel arches, the guards, the radiators. You are finished. Try very hard. Drive through the wastewater and the mud, uh, which is why you don't want to. Um, work in an area that is muddy or exposed soil. You don't want to drive through uh, the contaminants that you've washed off your car. I'm going to go through a little bit uh, through the diagrams that we have in our booklet. And we've included these to assist in quickly identifying key areas to inspect and clean on some typical industry equipment. Um, but before we go through that, just one last step is the final inspection. After you've washed your car, you know that you inspect it again just to make sure that you did indeed get all the claws of dirt uh, and, and seed material and plant material that was identified as, as being present. And you make sure that you, you inspect all of the places that you inspected in the first place, from uh, radiators and grills to the interior. All this should be free of seed roots, our fruit um, roots. Keep in mind that this, these diagrams do come from uh, another country, and the spelling of things is a little different. These are not typos. Uh, Tires, for instance, is really spelled like that. <laughs> so. Uh, it, feel free, of course, to jump in here. Um, for two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive vehicles, such as cars and trucks, you want to make sure that the floor mats, the pillows, the seats, and the interior uh, are clean. Uh, the radiator grill at the front of the vehicle and the engine bay are clean. You're going to want to pop the pop the hood and take a look inside. Make sure those are not contaminated. The underside, the chassis, the crevices, any of the ledges and the bumper bars need to be inspected and cleaned. All the wheels. Air tire, of course, and uh, the floor and the canopy if needed. Radiators and such and places where mud will be trapped will be the tracks. So you're going to want to focus on the chains and the plates and the tracks at the bottom, as well as the the boom, the bucket, and, and any other attachments um, for that machine. You also want to Concentrate on things like the cabin floor mat, uh, the paddle, and the seats, of course. And, uh, uh, 
the tires and the wheels uh, are the ones that are going to be uh, where a lot of the mud will be stuck. You now look at the wheel arches, the footsteps, the backhoe and bucket, um, the blade, the radiator grill and the engine bay, the chassis, again the air cleaner, and uh, all of the other side. Again, the tracks are going to be full of pieces of dirt, mud, seeds. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you get the underside, uh, the chassis, the floor mats, the cleaner again, but also the blade and the hydraulic rams in the front and the apron. The track chains, the place, uh, tracks, that's where most of the uh, and mud will be. We'll trap this as the drive sprocket. We're looking a little bit now at the status of the pro protocol in Ontario. Lastly, before we start taking questions, um, this is not legislated yet. It is a voluntary program, but the pros and cons to it. There's more pros I'm going to say than cons. Organizations are willing to implement this because there's no pressure from government. And people like doing things voluntarily. Um, and because it's voluntary, not everybody's going to be on the same level and they're not all going to be participating because it's not going to be enforced. It's good training. Um, and if, if good training is provided, it's something that the employees can really incorporate into their maintenance routine. It's easy to do. It's it's very well accepted um, and uh, it seems to be very positive. And it's I think small that you can do to prevent uh, increase in labor costs later on, especially for municipalities who are, uh, for instance, doing a lot of the invasive plant management in the first place, um, but are sure of course spreading it. Them. So you want to make sure that you inspect. Inspection is the key. You always have to clean, but in is a must, and uh, this has been started to be uh, especially in years when work is being contracted out. Um, the ideas for compliance includes, you know, a logbook, um, some kind of certification, which uh, apparently is, is what they do in Australia. Um, but an easy way of getting people to do this is by when you when you a contract when you contract out work to make sure that those contractors uh, are required to clean the the equipment that they use. In Ontario, widely, many organizations are starting to use it on their own. For instance, Ontario parks, conservation areas, uh, municipalities. Also, some equipment operators and service providers have also indicated that they've been using it. We've had a, a, just as of late a survey that we've we've done, and we surveyed people about the clean equipment protocol, and of the equipment operators surveyed. All of them use the, some sort of clean equipment protocol. Of all of the managers of service providers surveyed, 20% say that their company requires equipment cleaning. 20% say they use it as often as possible, but still 60% are not aware of policy in place in their firm. So this is something that you want to bring back to your organization and, and inform people about. Land managers that were surveyed, 40% of them required contractors to follow some kind of clean protocol. And that's a big number. That's a very, that's a very positive number. Uh, so it is being used and it is being incorporated. And, and for those of you not using it, and you are a service provider or a contractor, you should be aware that this is something that you're going to have to uh, implement more and more if you want to uh, be um, uh, competitive. 8%, however, uh, did not require uh, contractors to follow any kind of clean equipment protocol, but 18% are still considering it. So those are good numbers. Those are those are very positive. Uh, it's used in most Phragmites removal projects. Uh, it's used by the Michigan government as well outside of Canada in their policy invasive species decontamination for field operations in Michigan. The website is provided. 
And it's been also distributed to attendees of the 2013 County Highway Superintendents Meeting in New York. And it has also been provided. And many, many, many more places. Uh, it's, it's widespread and it's becoming all becoming a norm, how to say. Uh, but why we're here, again, is the first. A ton of people that we need to greatly acknowledge. Uh, including, of course, uh, the Tasmanian organization that uh, produced the original document, and Joe for bringing it to Canada. So, uh, and all of the people that seen on the slide. Again, want more information? Uh, please visit our website uh, or email me, uh, Amanda at oninvasive.ca, or give us a call. And if you want any of our documents or more information. Do not hesitate to give us a call. And I'm going to now go to the question and answer portion of our program today. And Joe, you're awfully quiet. Anything to add before we start with questions? No, thanks for uh, putting this and keeping this on the webinar uh, series. It's, it's good to keep the, the information out there and making sure that uh, as many people as possible uh, get access to it and, and learn about it and learn more about it. And it's really good to uh, on the survey that you know there's there's a, an increase in use or you know people are using it. So that's that's really, really helpful to hear. Great. We can We are looking for some questions, folks. So do not hesitate. Uh, don't have any questions yet? Where did you find the hardest aspects of of actually bringing this into Ontario. Uh, where was, uh, do you have any, um, I want to say, um, difficulties or people that were, uh, they know this is never going to fly, why are we bothering? Uh, did you have any tension? Did you have, how did you work around that if you did? Yeah, I, I think probably the one is, if I had my time again, I might change the name of the protocol to, to really focus on inspection. Would you? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the clean part is the is really the, the last bit that you need to do the inspection, the most critical, the most important. So people were nervous about the cleaning and the time and the effort and the equipment needed to put in there. Um, where really it's about knowing where you've been, where the equipment's been, where you're going, what species are in there, uh, what level of risk you know, it is available in there and then doing a quick inspection, you know, you can really reduce the requirement to clean. Um, and so and then you really only are cleaning when, when you need to. So it's not that this protocol says you need to clean all the time if you're moving, you know, two kilometers down the road. No, it's more of knowing where you've been, what equipment you're using, its use, um, and kind of what species are there from you are to where you're going. And yeah, so it's more of a really strong emphasis the the inspection, is knowing where you're going, using the resources you have available with you. Um, you guys have available on you know what species are in my area. So it's a lot of that information that that is is most critical. Cleaning part is is really just the the last little bit. It's it's it should be really really focused on the inspection part. Well, interesting. We might have to, when we go into uh, the next version of this document, which happens every few years, you go back and you mm. you republish and and think about what's uh, what can we can do better. Maybe we uh, we'll yeah. start changing the name. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's some of the training. Uh, it's this certified, um, nationally certified training in Australia, and they do a lot of a lot of the training is on you know we uh, we call them weeds, uh, invasive plants. Um, plan ID, knowing the plants, and then inspection. And it's really just the last little bit of the day and is, isn't actually in the cleaning. It's recognizing the activity and then, you know, uh, your focus is on mud, wet areas, but it's also looking at your equipment. So a lot of the equipment shown, the excavators, the diggers and whatnot, you know, they all have uh, hydraulics and grease and, you know, grease points and all that sort of stuff, right. which are also really good vectors for just picking up dry material and a kind of a wet, sticky surface. So just sort of knowing those areas and a lot of the equipment operators know those areas because they're the ones they're looking at all the time for kind of regular maintenance themselves. So that's when you said um, it's easy for people to kind of become sort of second nature and put into their maintenance routine because 
a lot of the operators of the equipment and even your own vehicles wrecked and kind of, you know, for their vehicles and maintaining it and keeping it in good condition. And this is just that extra little piece sort of kind of put your mindset in a different, you know, in a just a different mindset. Right. We've got questions now. Uh, one of the questions, I'm just having... Suggest cleaning equipment if there is no easy access to a water source. For instance, if you are in a remote area. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's it's one of those ones where that that can be a trough, uh, a sort of a trouble. So, um, some experience I've had uh, in Australia was you know we were in a very similar situation where um, it, what what had to happen in this instance was kind of regular cleaning. Right. So we knew we had a designated access point in. We had a designated road in. That's where we need to get to to do the work. Um, and then once we got out, um, you do a quick inspection before you left, try and take off a lot of the, I guess, the heavy material yourself, um, and then maybe potentially doing some of those uh, kind of, you know, crawling underneath the truck, trying to take some of those big, big materials out. Uh, doing the best as you can, and then basically taking it out that kind of designated route, and then taking it to the first base, basically available kind of water access that you could to to sort of to, to clean it in there. And in doing that, we then um, had a lot of uh, monitoring that we would do. So uh, the project itself lasted for uh, I'd say about six months, but then we had an additional kind of six months to a year monitoring just to see whether or not we we did actually kind of spread any and whatnot. So, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. You try and do your best and try and uh, get to an or get to a spot where you can have access to water as quickly as possible. Question. Uh, what does one do with the wastewater? It, it can vary, right? Um, you know, a lot of this is you know, you're in an area with invasive species, you've got material on your equipment so you're cleaning it off and and uh, really trying to contain it to to a, to a small area um, you know as you know we're assuming that that material is going to have invasive species in it and that it could actually sort of propagate and grow um, but there's there's different ways that you can do it it really depends on where you clean um, so as you said you know kind of like a gravel area in town kind of thing, you know, the chances of it actually kind of growing within that area is, is lower. There's still a risk, but it's low. Um, you've also put forward, you know, within the manual, you know, maybe going to kind of a, a heavily kind of cured grass area. That's once again, it's trying to re really reduce the risk of it kind of taking it out and uh, and really reducing the risk of kind of it actually sort of taking spreading and growing. Uh, with that kind of constant maintenance and kind of manicured lawn sort of situation. Um, so it's, it's you know, I think there are, you know, I was in Queensland, there was actually designated cleaning bays where they would actually uh, put the water into, it was a very kind of structured uh, system, uh, you know, built with cement and good access and that water would actually pull together and I'd actually have like a little filter system and then that would go into a larger area which could be inspected just to see whether or not any of the species would kind of take on. Um, so it, again, it's similar to the other question of would have access to water. You know, it's just trying to do your best right? Uh, and really trying to minimize that kind of risk as much as possible. And that probably goes together with our next question which is uh, how do you suggest you dispose of the contaminated material if you're in a parking lot or garage. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing that kind of depends on how much material that you kind of have. So if you kind of just bring the truck back in and you kind of wash it down maybe once a week, you know, you, you won't necessarily have that much material compared to, you know, I've got to really clean that uh, bulldozer or a truck or digger or, you know, like a large piece of equipment and it's quite dirty. You know, um, a a lot of kind of systems and places where people go, they kind of really kind of pull it together and then they can, 
I guess there's different methods and it's once again it's kind of trying to know where you've been and what species that you're dealing with so right. like Japanese knotweed then yeah you you'd kind of take more um, put more emphasis on where you would want to put it and that sort of stuff um, so people do kind of take it to sort of uh, more kind of areas where they can kind of control and look after it and kind of dispose it properly other people you know once again, you know, if they're able to kind of bring it back to like a cleaning bay or back to their kind of uh, home base, I guess, or their kind of work garage and kind of clean it off there, then they need to dispose of it necessarily. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a good question. It's, it's once again, it's kind of kind of reduce that kind of risk, I guess. Right. What what we recommend people do is first of all, don't compost. Put it in the compost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you're gonna, you, it may or may not grow, but if it does, it could be spread on your garden afterwards and take hold. Uh, but if it's a smaller amount and it's a manageable amount, where you can put it in a black garbage bag, yep. leave it in the sun. That'll bake yep. the seeds. It'll bake the the viable material, and, and and so you can dispose of it easily after that. So yep. two or three weeks in the sun in a black garbage bag. Yeah, that's that's a great point. That's 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 a really good way of doing it. Yeah, you can kind of treat it like when you when you go out and, and pull in bases and, and clean it up. If you use similar similar things there. So yeah, that's a really good point. I hope that answers your question. Then. I'm looking through, just looking, making sure we've got all the questions answered. Um, all those that are a few of those people that had audio problems, uh, you will be able to re-listen to the entire presentation online when we get it uh, up there in either today or tomorrow. Uh, I've answered, we've answered, I think, Ah, that's a new one. Thank you. Is there any mention of the clean equipment protocols in the new Ontario Invasive Species Act? And not, is there something in the future for the Act in relation to being held accountable for your actions? Uh, do you want me to touch on that or would you like to? No, go for it. No, well, there isn't anything specific as of yet. The Act itself um, was passed, I believe it was November of 2015, but the regulations uh, for that act, they're going to come out first um, this year. So uh, the actual regulatory tools that, uh, that may or may not incorporate the clean equipment protocol or something of that nature uh, won't come out until later this year. So keep your eye on that uh, and let's hope that there is something uh, in the pipeline for that. She washed off material from going down into the sewer. Yes, that's one thing that we can uh, we you know we can do um, a lot of even within the cleaning areas where you're washing it down. We're, we're really trying to kind of um, control that area. So you'll see like on that one photo there um, that we showed, there was uh, you know the the fence around trying to contain that. Uh, material. Uh, other people have the like the silk socks kind of thing around to prevent that kind of heavy material um, from going down into the sewer. And once again, it's it's trying to prevent. Once again, you know, if it gets into the sewer, then there's it's a low risk, but there's still a risk that that material could get down in the sewer, get into a waterway, and then kind of take root somewhere else. Once again, it's it's, it's all about your risk. Um, I think uh, by doing something simple of trying to uh, collect kind of that heavy material uh, before it enters the sewer is always a good practice. Absolutely, I would concur. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another great question. What training is provided in terms of movement of movement of plants with no plowing. Uh, you know what? Great, and uh, nothing that I know of. Um, we don't do that at the moment. An interesting, interesting point. I know some of the, the training back in Australia kind of is focused on different activities and industries. Uh, it's really, really important um, to kind of make it practical and really connect to people on the landscape doing that work. Um, once again, it's 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 all about the activity and and the risk. So yeah, you know potentially on um, you know as as a good example, it's fragmentis on roadsides, right? So driving down the road on that hard surface, yeah, you may not get things, but uh, wintertime snow plowing, 
uh, summertime, you've got the, the mowers out there trimming uh, the sides of the roads. You know, they're, they're all um, uh, known vectors and, um, of spreading material down there. Um, sort of thing. So you're right, it, it, it is an interesting one. I'm not sure, I'm not aware of any kind of training in regards to the sort of snow plowing. But, you know, I, I would treat it as, you know, it still has that risk of potential spread. Absolutely. Um, just just the way that it's, it operates in some of the snow, snow plows there. I think probably the, the mowing along the side, they really kind of get into areas and really get kind of messy and mucky and whatnot so that probably has a has a higher risk of kind of spreading around but um, and when the snow melts uh, anything that you've transported will be in a new area that's true yeah. that's true so yep definitely uh definitely potential there for for that spread um what seems to be the most efficient tools for cleaning large equipment quickly and specific are transportable uh, I was fortunate enough to join the Invasive Plan Council on one of their sessions with the, uh, I want to say the roadside managers, or uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. You know, we kind of ran out of time a little bit, but I know one of the guys there who, who that's his business is that kind of roadside maintenance. You know, he he's really kind of jumped in and, and used the protocol. So he has his, uh, obviously, his uh, mower sort of slasher, but then his, his truck, and his truck has a little... Uh, it has the water, he's got some water on there, he's got some uh, kind of, uh, he's got like a pump um, there that and kind of generate a system sort of set up so that he can, um, you know, because he basically needs that to drive home every day. So it's always there with him and then he can kind of um, clean uh, as needed, when needed. Um, obviously the bigger the truck and the and the bigger the equipment and then kind of essentially the messier it is, so uh, makes it a lot of, a lot difficult. Um, it, it's really easy to clean in the dry. So if the material is dry, you can really kind of knock off the, 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 the clods and the clumps of, of dirt and pull the material out. Right. Uh, that's why we recommend to sort of, you know, if we need to get into areas uh, where um, we can use sort of air pressure to do that first, because uh, once you make things wet, it really becomes sticky and it's very difficult to actually clean. Yeah. And I think the other point here is, once again, we're really just trying to reduce the risk. So we're not wanting to make the, like, the excavator shiny, you know, for sale. We're just <laughs> trying to make it kind of clean and get that equipment off, so um, that material off. So uh, if um, it's one of those ones of, you know, as long as we get sort of that main material off, and get some of that kind of really visible material uh, in those sort of key areas, then then hopefully that should be um, enough to kind of reduce that risk of spread. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody, for participating today. I hope it was useful to you. Uh, once again, any information that we have is available free of charge and on our website. Please visit us if you want any more information or some resources regarding the Clean Amendment Protocol. Thank you, Joe Halloran, our, our panelist today, our expert on the subject, and also uh, the main reason why our, why our Clean Equipment Protocol is here. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Please visit us uh, again in two weeks' time for our next uh, Gromian Stead webinar. Have a wonderful, cool, and snowy afternoon.